Through our entire fertile years, most women produce a lot of estrogen. It is vital for fertility. It helps grow our breasts, gives us our lovely curves. Then suddenly when we are in perimenopause or menopause, we are being told by mainstream medical system that God forbid we replace our estrogen because it is going to give us breast cancer. The number one question that I get asked in my business is, will estrogen replacement therapy give me breast cancer? Well, ladies, in today's podcast, we're going to go deep on estrogen's role in breast cancer, estrogen replacement, and estrogen metabolism. With me today to shed some light on this very intense topic <laughs> is Dr. Tara Scott. Dr. Tara Scott is the hormone guru, helps people find the cause of their symptoms and get them on a path to optimal health. With over 25 years of experience and three board certifications in OBGYN, functional medicine, and integrative mes- medicine, Dr. Scott has helped thousands of patients struggling with hormone issues, including endometriosis, breast cancer, weight gain, and more. She is the founder of Revitalized Medical Group and Hormone Guru Academy, a course to help patients improve their hormone problems themselves. After suffering from fertility and curing her own endometriosis, she now helps others achieve this that same balance. She recently partnered her practice with Forum Health to take Revitalized to the next level. Dr. Scott has been speaking, including a recent TEDx talk, and educating for over 10 years and has taught doctors her approach in five continents. For her expertise, she has been featured on The List TV, Women's Health, Shape, The List, Newsweek, Parents, Authority Magazine, and on numerous podcasts. You can find her at hormone forward slash guru.md. So welcome, Dr. Tara Scott. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes. All you're doing, trying to educate women on what their options are. So yeah, I feel like there's very few of us out there. <laughs> it's it's just I can't believe in this day and age there isn't that much information out there still. But you know, it's come a long way because when I went to medical school, there was no internet. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I am that- always like, oh, I think, oh, it's really getting out there. The word's really spreading. But then you like you hear from people in on a daily basis that are asking these questions that are like, oh, I, well, I was told never to replace my hormones. It's going to kill me. And you're yes. like, oh my gosh, there's still so much misinformation out there. <laughs> yes. I recently joined a, uh, just to kind of check it out. I, I joined a menopause Facebook group, but just a free group online. And uh, there's, she has something like, like 30,000 women in this. And it was so depressing because it was just one post after the other of these women talking about what they're going through, the pain that they're experiencing in their life and how they just don't know what to do. And I'm like, really, this is still, we're still asking these questions, but yeah, anyways, so thank you for what you do as well. (laughs) So you have a personal story, just kind of about even you coming from the medical world into the functional world because of infertility and endometriosis. And I would love to hear that story. I had endometriosis too. Yeah. Well, I mean, mine was mild and I know I get a lot of heckling online when I say I cured mine, but I do have the laparoscopic pictures to prove it. Um, And it's not the typical uh, or normal response, but that was my experience. And so, you know, I, I always had painful periods as a teen And, you know, was drawn to OBGYN in medical school, liked to take care of women, felt very awkward around men, probably. That was also what made me go into it. But, you know, I just really love taking care of women of all the stages. And when I finished my residency, I was really interested in doing a reproductive gynecology fellowship, but they just changed it to three more years. So I just wasn't, I wanted to get on with my life and I didn't want to spend more time training, even though I love the endocrinology part of it. So I just went into general OBGYN. And then when it came time to be, get pregnant with my own, my own family, I wasn't able to conceive without medications, without fertility drugs. So, you know, had my first daughter with Clomid had about, I don't know, 10 or 11 failed cycles in between, including a miscarriage, then finally had IVF and had my twins and even my pregnancies, that pregnancy was very complicated and delivery and anyway. So, you know, the doctor's not the good patient, but after I was done with my fertility, that was it. I had been diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, not given really wow. much except for thyroid replacement, but no, you know, nothing. And then I had endometriosis. So it's like, go back on the birth control pill. And like here, I'm like, 
taking birth control when I never could conceive. And did I really need to, I mean, I guess you need yeah. to prevent it. But there's no option for people other than getting them pregnant, keeping them pregnant, delivering. You know, I was trained to do an emergency C-section. I could cut a baby out in a minute, you know, which is great. But then we get no training traditionally from when you're done with childbearing, even until menopause. And at that time, when I kind of started specializing, this was over, it was probably about 20 years ago. So there wasn't a lot of data there, even about menopause. That was right around the, just a year or two after the WHI came out. So, you know, I, I, I really decided to, to learn more um, about hormones and went to some courses. And at the time, you know, there really wasn't a lot around um, some of the compounding, you know, PCCA put it on and ZRT put a few on. And then I became a certified menopause practitioner in 2006 to the North American Menopause Society, which is traditional, but it is yeah. give me access to all of their publications and their, you know, it, you know, to make sure that since I'm a traditionally trained doctor, I've got one leg kind of steeply in the science, in the research, in the physiology, and then I've got the holistic, you know, I'm straddling the two, which I think is important to have mm -hmm. evidence behind what we do. So, uh, you know, the, the more you learn, you realize the less, you know, and so I went on to do a fellowship with A4M and get a board certification there and then kind of grandfathered into sitting for my integrative medicine boards. And then I, I have been teaching since 2010, which is great, you know, to get, you know, more people to understand how to do this. And there's so much more evidence available now than when I started this in 2004, um, you know, to support what we're doing. And I remember I was kind of heckled by the group I joined. I, I had been in practice. I joined, I was solo for a couple of years. Then I joined a, a large OBGYN practice. And when I first got there, they heckled me about doing hormone replacement therapy. And at our morning meetings, they would fire away questions. And I would just keep answering with the studies. And after about two rounds of that, they're like, okay, you know, do what you want, you know? And so there's so much more available to support what we do now, which is really great. Yeah. To be coming out of, you know, the, the women's health initiative and, and starting to replace hormones, you must've, yeah, you must've been really stirring the pot. <laughs> There was really, you know, because there was a time period after that study came out in 2002, where it really was discouraged for anyone to take hormones. It still is. And, it, and <laughs> yes. And so that was, a that, 20 years ago. that was 20 years ago. And if you pulled 10 gynecologists, I bet you nine of them would say, don't take hormones because they cause cancer. Because and that's, that study. That, that's crazy. Yeah. You know, that you would, that, that, that is still the mentality. And again, like I said, oh, I was told I can't take them. I can't, you know, I had blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, that's a reason you can't take oral synthetic estrogen. Yes. You know, or whatever the issue is. Um, so it, there's still a lot, of, there is still a lot of misinformation and then we're trying to get our information out there. And then our traditional colleagues are, you know, kind of throwing shade at what I'm saying. So it's, it's a difficult thing, but I think patients are doing their own research and thankfully due to the advent of the internet and social media, there is access to a lot more and podcasts and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that there's a connection between like in your research, have you ever seen a connection between Hashimoto's and endometriosis? So Being now that the data that's coming out with endometriosis is it yeah, is a, an autoimmune. Yeah. Thing. They haven't come out and said that they haven't isolated an antibody, but what they're seeing, yeah. it's more like it is a hormonally sensitive condition, but it's also a, a, an upregulation of the immune system and almost like a, what they call a peritonitis without bacteria. So a microbiome shift as well. So it's super exciting. Uh, uh, part of what I was preparing for the new A4M was to do a deeper dive on some of these gynecological issues. And so there, there are peer reviewed journals, there's data saying that, you know, endometriosis is a, is a, they have an abnormal amount of macrophages in the peritoneal fluids of people with, with um, endometriosis. So it is a multifactorial approach. It's not just, you know, when we see patients, we look at their gut microbiome, and we look at their estrogen detox and we look at their hormone levels and we look at their diet, we look at everything. So it's not just a hormonally sensitive issue. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I'm, I've been waiting for more information to come out about how it might be or is an autoimmune condition. Same with polycystic ovarian syndrome too. There's talk of it being an immune issue as well. And it's like, hmm, where's this going to go? It'll be interesting to see. Yeah. There's some data about the microbiome with that one as yeah. well. But which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting. Well, breast cancer, Dr. Terrace got to tell you, it, this is like the hot topic and it's pretty confusing. Like I have researched it for a very long time. I've watched a lot of your talks on it and, you know, there's evidence kind of going both ways, but I want to hear from you, you know, the kind of history of behind the breast cancer and kind of taking a deeper dive, kind of going under the hood, so to speak. And, you know, for some of you, this may be a little bit too complicated, a little too sciencey, um, but bear with us because I think it's important that we kind of take this topic to the next level um, so that everybody can really get an understanding of what's going on when it comes to estrogen's role in breast cancer. So let's start off with, you know, the, just what age are we seeing breast cancer most prevalent in? Gosh, yesterday I saw a patient who came in from the other side of the country to see me and she was 31 when she was first diagnosed. Oh, yeah. you know, so, you know, that's the crazy thing about breast getting cancer. Getting younger. Before we even talk about breast cancer, I mean, it's like everything we just talked about. It's not just hormones. It's also environment. Mm -hmm. It's also immune system. It's also gut microbiome. It's all, it's toxins It's and it's genetic SNPs not just, so the traditional SNPs that are detected for breast cancer um, risk are usually like BRCA. And now it's not BRCA1, BRCA2, it's, you know, RAD50, CHECK2, PALB, PALB, whatever. So it's a lot more, but those are all tumor suppressor genes, which means that they're genes that suppress the growth of a tumor. So in the normal cell cycle, you have cell growth and cell death and cancer is the failure of a cell to die. It just keeps growing. And in that situation, what's supposed to happen is the immune system is supposed to do something and the cell's supposed to commit suicide. That's what we learn in medical school, but something happens that prevents that. So you have unregulated growth, which is cancer. And so in certain, I mean, in any tissue of the body, that's what cancer is, right? Unregulated growth. Right. And so, you know, for hormonally sensitive places like breast and uterus, you know, we, and prostate, we think about, um, you know, estrogen. And so the problem arises that there's different types of breast cancer. So we got to look at premenopausal when people have just their own endogenous hormones. We got to look at postmenopausal are they taking hormones? Are they not taking hormones? Is it a, you know, estrogen, progesterone, HER2 new sensitive, triple negative? There's lots of different types of tumors. But before we even get into that, I always explain to patients about water. I mean, let's just say I told all my patients to drink two liters of water every day and they took it to heart and they drank two liters of water and you're my patient and you go run a marathon in 80 degrees, which you guys use different units. So what would that That's be? Okay. <laughs> Most so, of my listeners are from the state. So, okay. So <laughs> if I, if you stuck to the two liter recommendation, you would get dehydrated. And on the other hand, if you were a patient who was on dialysis and you drank two liters of water, it could give you heart failure. So is water dangerous? Does that mean nobody should ever drink water because water is a problem? Or is it the clinical situation of the patient and the, you know, the way they he handle water? That's the problem. So I have a hard time thinking an, an endogenous hormone that everybody has is toxic, right? right. So right. part of it lies in the fact that the, uh, the estrogen that was initially studied isn't a bioidentical estrogen. It is a uh, different type of equilin sulfate and lots of estrogens called premarin with most of it is equilin sulfate, which has a longer half-life, doesn't break down the same in our body than our own endogenous estradiol. Yeah. Well, the other problem is we have three types of estrogen in our body. We have estradiol, we have estrone, and we have estriol. They all act at the receptor differently. We have an estrogen alpha and beta receptor. Alpha makes everything grow and beta makes, kind of puts the brakes on. So how your body, what your ratio of estrone to estradiol to me makes a difference. So there's those issues with, you know, estrogen and estrogen. And then the question is, like I said, was it premenopausal? Did you have your own, you know, in, in the patient that I saw yesterday, she was on oral contraceptives, which, you know, is synthetic estrogen and a synthetic progestin. So the initial WHI study 
which was not done to measure harm and it wasn't done to measure effectiveness. It was done because they wanted to get the FDA approval for an additional indication of prevention of heart disease. That's why the study was done, not to see if there was an increased adverse events. So they couldn't use a population or cohort that was around the time of menopause because they were making it a randomized placebo controlled trial. So they had women who the average age was 65 and the risk of breast cancer from 50 to 65 is going to be a lot different. The older you get, the increase the risk. And so when that study came up that there was an increased risk of breast cancer, everybody still associates that hormones cause breast cancer. And in that situation, it was an oral, uh, it was an oral synthetic estrogen. Equilin sulfate was most of what which it was. comes from the, horses when she says that. Yeah. <laughs> horses and the, and the other uh, uh, big component was estrone, which is the one that wants to stimulate breast growth, not estradiol. And there might've been some estradiol in there, but there was a lot. And then it was a synthetic progestin. So since then, since that study, the North American Menopause Society has recognized that, you know, not all hormone therapy is has equal risks when it comes to breast cancer. And there does indeed seem to be a decrease or maybe not an increase in risk in bioidentical forms, which is would be like an estradiol patch and micronized progesterone. They say that it's the progestin that makes the difference because in the breast, estrogen causes growth. And when you take bioidentical progesterone, it causes cell death. But this progestin that was studied causes the opposite of that, more growth. So when you take something like Prempro, you're getting growth, growth. So that's why in that arm, there was an increased risk of breast cancer. So there's a lot of misinterpretation of the data. And, and you know, so they're trying to kind of stomp that out. And so we got to figure out this issue of, you know, why do some people get cancer with taking no hormones? Why do get some people get cancer when they take hormones? Again, go back to the water. You know, how are they processing their hormones that goes into the estrogen detoxification? Are there any other any other markers in the environment? Are they exposed to something? What is their immune system like? You know, we know with, you know, how many years we've been living with HIV that so certain cancers are increased incidence with them because they have a failure of their immune system. So we know the immune system is involved in any type of cancer as well. So there's so many variables, but what the, the bad news is still estrogen, 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 right? Don't take it. It's going to cause cancer. Yeah. And I've, I've read to or heard her other practitioners speaking about this, which was when you actually look at the results of the study, even in the arm of the group that had the progestins that had that increase of breast cancer, it was actually a very small increase. I think it was even, like eight out of a thousand or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the arm of the study that the women were only using the Premra and the estrogen, that there was a reduction. Once again, a very small one, but there that was a reduction. Because that's been misinterpreted that if you take estrogen only, there's no increased risk of breast Which, cancer. Right. Yes. And that yes. study only had about 10,000 people in the estrogen only arm. And the nurse's health study had 122,000 people, and they had almost like a 20 to 40% increase in breast cancer with estrogen only. And then the other study that had 80,000 people in it, uh, the E3 EPIC cohort, which was published in 2008, had also had an increased risk of breast cancer with estrogen only. So yeah. we are iatro iatrogenically giving people an increased risk of breast cancer as physicians, because that's still standard of care after hysterectomy yes. to give only. And it drives me crazy. Me too. Yeah. I just did a whole podcast a month ago, two parts. So two hours long, all about progesterone. And a lot of what I speak about is the benefits beside in the uterus <laughs> that why we absolutely need that progesterone to counterbalance even in the growth of the breast tissue. And was it in your talk that I heard how the endometrial lining and the breast tissue is similar? Yes, that's in that's our amazing. textbook, Leon Spiroff, Clinical right. Clinic Endocrinology. He says the breast and the endometrial cell are similar. And so that's why like this, this is a textbook that anyone who is an OBGYN resident knows this is our bo endocrinology Bible. So why people are not connecting the dots. And, and, and part of that is, like I said, when you go to medical school, you learn all your physiology, you learn all your pathology, and then we're taught algorithms in our clinical practice. If the patient has this, rule out this, this, and this, and if they don't have this, do this. That's not a root cause approach, right? And so even with breast cancer, you know, um, it's... <laughs> 
it's, we need to find out why, but nobody's interested in that. They're like, okay, you have cancer. These are the algorithms. We're going to treat it. You have this percentage, this, you're going to have this. We, this is what's been studied. You have this stage. You have to have this surgery, this radiation, this chemo, and then you have to have tamoxifen or you have to have whatever, and there's no deviation. And I get it. You have to be careful with people with cancer. We don't want them to have a recurrence, but there's never any, like, why did you get it? Right. right. So what yeah. is wrong? And especially where it matters is the perimenopausal people. Like I said, when I'm seeing patients that are in their thirties with cancer that are going to be remote from menopause, we have to figure out what is their, what are their, and the, the solution is not right. to eradicate their hormones for 15 more years, which is what is being done. And like take what their breasts off. Seeing, well, not only that, just knocking out their ovaries and like, what are they not looking at the data between heart? The number one killer in women is heart disease. Number two is stroke. Number three is lung cancer. Number four is breast cancer. If you add up two, three, and four, you still don't equal the number of deaths from heart disease. And so why are we putting these people at a markedly increased risk of heart disease? Because we're castrated, you know, what's, what's the yeah, word? Yeah, you could say castrated. We've got our own, but we got our women balls in there. <laughs> Yes. We're yeah. taking out their hormones and shutting it down. And, you know, and, and I'm like, well, what's the plan after that? You're only going to be 40 then. So then what's the plan? Yeah. You and, know? and just so everybody knows, we know that estrogen, progesterone, testosterone are all very important for preventing heart disease, not yes. oral hormones, yes. um, not oral estrogen that can increase your risk, but topical estrogen has been shown to help not to, so that you do not do not develop heart disease. It can reduce well, your risk. Right. And there's a lot of studies showing that women who have had their ovaries removed before 45 have a markedly increased risk of heart attacks. You know, there's a lot of data that way that not they're taking hormones, they're not taking hormones and what the consequence of that is. And so there is this protective effect that estrogen has. And that's why, you know, my brother passed away at 38 of a heart attack and it is tragic, but it's not uncommon to hear a male at that age have a heart attack and die, but it is very uncommon to hear a woman have a heart attack before she's 50 because estrogen does provide some protection. They actually did a study where a woman, and I don't think this was randomized, but it was a, they, they saw these ST changes on the EKG. So they put an estrogen patch on her. And they also had another arm that they gave them tetrahydrobiopterin, which increases nitric acid, which helps blood flow. And they saw that the changes from the person who had the ST changes on EKG were the same for the women who had the estrogen patch versus the tetrahydrobiopterin, which, you know, was a precursor to nitric acid or nitric oxide. So, um, so there was shown that it actually did help in coronary perfusion. And so it's so crazy. Again, we, we live in this, this system. And then we got to say about the evidence, the evidence, the evidence, we'll just think about actually what's driving the evidence. Is anyone going to study this unless they have a product to market? Right. Like study a hormone just to see what are the benefits of estrogen just for the. Yeah. We're we going to go pour millions of dollars into value. researching this. Yeah. Wait, who's going to study endogenous hormones, right? Nobody yeah. cares about endogenous hormones. I mean, I do. And you know, I just actually put, presented a poster at the North American Menopause Society. I mean, it's shocking that I got it accepted. It was rejected initially. And then I had to kind of dumb it down a little bit and take out the estrogen detox of it. And then I just put it in like, okay, here's a literature review about breast cancer and endogenous levels and exogenous, you know, endogenous hormones, exogenous hormones, levels in breast cancer. I did, you know, there's not a lot of data. There were some studies that looked at estrogen metabolites and they had a certain pattern of certain metabolites associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. And then there was some data that said endogenous levels, but a lot of the studies were done in the follicular phase, which drives me crazy because the luteal phase is a lot of times where you're lacking progesterone. Yeah. So they weren't done at the right time of the cycle. They're done at the follicular phase. There was a couple that were done in the luteal phase and they did see that higher estrogen in the luteal phase and lower progesterone it extrapolated with an increased risk of breast cancer. There was also studies of higher endogenous testosterone in premenopausal women. So there are studies out there that are looking at it, not a lot. And the studies that were published on estrogen metabolites were published prior to like 2015, which where the assays changed. So the, the lab assays also changed for these estrogen metabolites, which so they're more sensitive. So some of the data was prior to that. Now, again, who's going to fund those studies to look at that, look at that risk. I was like really passionate about this when I was, I had an administration 
you know, put position at the hospital, I met with the research team and I'm like, I think, you know, we should be looking at these SNPs. It was SNPs and breast cancer. And I said, we could just do a retrospective chart analysis of my, you know, patients. And they were like, well, you, we didn't hire you for a research position. We hired you for this clinical admin position. So if you want to fund your own research, you can, we can do the study. Which looking at the big picture, this doing this research, imagine what it would do for the healthcare system. Right. Because women are reaching menopause and having health problem after health problem because of the loss of her hormones a lot of the time. So it could take the burden off the healthcare system. Women are having to quit their jobs for heaven's sakes. Like I've heard that so many times where menopausal women, because they're suffering so much that they're having to leave these like high corporate jobs because the stress is too much and their physical body cannot take it. Like, that's yeah, so yeah. depressing. If this was happening to men, Yes. I mean, that statistic is out there, which is a step in the right direction. And then we got that Super Bowl commercial, even though I it was heard, yes. it was non-hormonal treatment for hot flushes, but whatever, Super Bowl. And there's nothing that I can personally talk about, but there's some, uh, some uh, brands that have approached me to help them just for an informational perspective on menopause, just to get information out there, which is fantastic, you know, it is. so- Hopefully some stuff will be coming this year that is just for information. So it is changing. The, the landscape is changing for menopause. But then again, this whole breast cancer thing, I feel really more called that it's really more a premenopausal thing or a perimenopausal thing. I think that we're so focused on early detection, but I feel like we should be focused on prevention because mm-hmm. if we have this data that says if your luteal estradiol levels are in the 75th quartile or above, you have an increased risk of breast cancer. Like, do you, do you think if someone came to you, Karen, and said, you have an increased risk of breast cancer, all you have to do is eat less chicken, eat less red meat, you have to, you know, eat more broccoli, cabbage, and kale, and, you know, let's monitor your hormones, let's be good about self-breast exams, let's exercise, let's blah, blah, blah. Would you do that if someone said you were going to have an increased risk of breast cancer? A hundred percent. Absolutely. I mean, there's even small, small studies that say like the Puerto Rican cuisine with its um, criollo, which is like tomato and garlic and onion had a decreased incidence of breast cancer in that population. And usually the Hispanics, I mean, I'm a half Puerto Rican that they, usually that's a pop population that has increased incidence of everything, you know, like diabetes and everything. So little tweaks like that. I think if you knew you were at risk, you would do that. There yeah. are people who have alcoholism in their family. So they choose not to drink because they know that they have that predisposition or not to use drugs because somebody in their family was affected. It's the same with breast cancer, but these patients who want to seek that out, like I said, my brother died at 38 of a heart attack. So now what do you think I do? I mean, I monitor my heart. I like, no, I found out I was pre-diabetic. He was a diabetic. And he had every risk factor. And so now I know with that family history, I need to do certain things because I don't want that to happen. So it's like, there are people who wouldn't change anything. They don't want to know. But for the people that do want to know and want options, that's not given to them. Yeah. Even vitamin D levels. I, I was taught that by Susan Wad. you know, Susan Wadia. Wadia. She wrote a book called Busting Breast Cancer. And she studied breast cancer for 10 years because she had a good friend that died from it. And she was, she was telling me how in research, it shows that women, that that's a preventative measure of making sure that your vitamin D levels are over 65. Yep. And I was like, documented. who knew even last night I was cooking dinner. Uh, and I was, cause I'd listened to your, uh, slideshow about, you know, preventative things for breast cancer. <laughs> so I was like, Oh, I'm putting in my onion and garlic. Dr. Scott right. would be proud of me. That information should be out there. So I've, somehow I stumbled into this niche, uh, even within the hormone niche of breast cancer by speaking about it and having podcasts out there. So now I have breast cancer patients that come to me mostly after the diagnosis. And then, yeah. you know, again, they're, they're given the treatment and then it's like, okay, see you when it comes back, you know, here's your surveillance. We'll do your mammograms. We'll do your MRIs. We'll do whatever. Or you, you've had tamoxifen. Anxiety. See you later. Right. And you know, gosh, if you actually look at the, the receptor affinity of tamoxifen for the estrogen receptor, yeah, it was terrible. It, it's I not mean, very it's, high at all. No, like, I was surprised to see it, that. It's like saying you're going to send a middle school <laughs> football team in the, against the NFL in the Super Bowl. Like, who do you yeah. think is going to win that match? Like, the pro football players versus, like, a little, wing, you know, 11-year-old boys. Like, that's the difference in the receptor affinity. So 
I've had so many patients on tamoxifen, you know, that actually are still having periods. So it's not completely blocking estrogen. I know it doesn't in the uterus, but they're still having periods. They've had sky high serum levels of estradiol. And I've called the oncologist saying, yeah. you know, really uncomfortable. This patient has really high estrogen levels. Oh, that's okay. Cause tamoxifen is a blocker. It's not a hundred percent blocker. I mean, a Rimidex does a lot better job at actually blocking that. I would say is near a hundred percent of actually blocking that enzyme, but tamoxifen is a receptor agonist, is egg, right? Not a hundred percent blockage of an enzyme. So all these women who are on tamoxifen for five years, ten years, yeah. and still making lots of estrogen, it's it's not enough. Yeah, I was very shocked to hear that because that okay. seems to be like the number one drug prescribed for a woman post breast cancer. Because that's what the data show. That's the trial, right? Ah, well, and yeah. I get that oncologists, that's the information they have. Right. Nobody wants anyone to get cancer again. And that cancer patient is terrified of recurrence, right? And terrified of death. So they're going to do, and I never encourage anybody to not do what their oncologist says. You know, we're, what we do is not instead of, is an adjunct to, you know, well, let's monitor your hormones. Let's change your diet. Let's look at your gut. Let's look at what else we can do mm -hmm. to decrease your risk. Yeah, absolutely. What is the research telling us now about the, the, like how xenoestrogens, what is their role in this increase of breast cancer in women? Like, are we seeing that? Yeah. If you're exposed to a lot of these xenoestrogens, you, your risk is higher. So, you know, the xenoestrogens do seem to have a part because the endocrine disruptors can agonize the alpha receptor, which is the growth receptor like BPA. So there's all those environmental things that can affect it. And then there's the phytoestrogens, which when I looked at the data of that, it's actually, that's positive. That's not mm -hmm. a negative thing because we have these populations like the Japanese that eat a lot of soy and they don't have an increased risk of breast cancer incidence. And so, you know, yeah, it, most phytoestrogens are more so towards the better receptor, correct? Yeah. I mean, they, and they, I don't know that that has also been documented and looked at, but okay. they, they can agonize the receptor and give some estrogen like, like production, but they actually, I, I, one of the articles that I had to look at this for this, this conference this month was that, that the, it was the endocrine disruptors actually are agonizing the alpha receptor of estrogen and acting like estrogens. Yeah. And I hear our body will prefer it over our own because it's stronger. Like, so it'll take that before it'll take our own estrogen. Is that true? I, you know, again, again, no, has anyone looked at this in vivo or in right. vitro? How are they looking at that? Right. So we don't really know the science of it, but I do know I have talked to other colleagues who say, you know, what, and we do this with our, we, we haven't done it recently, but we do like kind of a hormone boot camp with our patients that one of the days is all about detoxing your environment. So removing plastic. So just like, Hey, don't drink out of those reusable water or not reusable, the disposable water bottles and get rid of your Tupperware and get make up your makeup and everything. And even with that, and some say uh, minimizing poultry, you know, instead of every day, once a week, whatever, and red meat, that even estrogen levels they're seeing on testing is going down. And and patients are are seeing, you know, differences in the effects of estrogen, like lighter periods or less breast tenderness. So, I mean, I think that all needs to really be addressed. Yeah. And, you know, there's books out there like The Truth About Cancer by Ty Bollinger. And then I think, is it Nisha Winters that wrote Out of the Box Cancer Therapies? I mean, so there's things out there that are people can do holistically, not specifically hormonally, but just holistically with any diagnosis of cancer um, that that ha that can be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the three estrogens, you know, and how they're good or bad. And, you know, because like you said before, estrone is the one that it acts on primarily or completely on the alpha receptors. And so it has more it has growth some, to it. It has, it has activity at the beta as well. Okay. So, I mean, estradiol is like a hundred percent, a hundred and fifty right? affinity as far as alpha and beta, where estrone is something like 60 at the alpha receptor and 37 at the beta. So it's like a five to one ratio. It's going to prefer to cause growth specifically where the alpha receptor is, which is breast and uterus. And the beta receptor is like bone, kidney, brain, you know, skin, 
So it's the alpha that's causing the growth. And then you have estriol, which is the weakest. And I don't remember exactly what the numbers are, but they're like in the teens. So it has a predisposition or preference for the beta. Mm -hmm. And so the estrone, um, so what the estrone is what I think most of the endocrine disruptors are acting as if, and Uh that's where the tricky thing is, is that, you know, women can get their ovaries removed and 95% of their estradiol is coming from the ovary during your reproductive life. But there is a bidirectional enzyme that 17 beta HSD, which estradiol can turn into estrone and vice versa. So you can have your ovaries removed and you can still have a lot of estrogen, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. won't show up up in your serum because when you're measuring serum testing, it's what is the ovary producing and putting into the blood system. And when we measure serum, it's a venous blood. So if the conversion of estradiol to estrone or DHEA to estrone is happening in your periphery, you're not going to see it with the blood. I mean, I always tell the, I always give the example of, you know, well, she's 21 now, but if my daughter left my house when she was in high school and sweats and said, mom, I'm going to the library and study. And I thought, oh my gosh, she's such a great kid. She gets to her friend's house changes into a tank top and miniskirt, pulls out a fake ID and goes clubbing. I'm never going to see that conversion. It's outside of my house, right? Right. It's happening in the periphery. She's going to go clubbing, go underage drinking. I'm never going to hear about it or see about it, right? Because all I see is what happens in the venous system. So that change, it's not coming in from your muscle and fat going into the serum as estrone to elevate. I mean, it have to be in excess to, to elevate the estrone, right? Cause that is happening in the tissue. It's having its action within the tissue, within the breast, within the fat cells, whatever. And then any excess is going to leak into the serum to be you know, recirculated. And that's why we have, you know, what's going on in our gut with that, with estrogen detox, what's going on in our urine, what is, what is coming out. Yeah. So the urine will measure it properly. The estrone levels in the tissue. You know, I have had this debate about testing different hormone levels with Mark Newman from the Dutch test, David Zava from ZRT from saliva and George Gilson, who, who founded a lab in Canada, Rocky mountain analytical. Right. Yep. So he's an MD. And so that is part of the confusion of anything hormones, whether it's prescribing, monitoring, whatever. So when we're looking at the urine metabolites, what what surprised me in reviewing the, the evidence is that when urinary estrogen metabolites are high, the parent compounds, estra, estradiol and estrone, there actually was a lower risk of breast cancer. And I thought, what? Why is that? I would think it would be the opposite if you have so much. So does that mean that you are efficiently getting rid of it? So you have high metabolites, right? What, well, how, how does that correlate? Does it correlate with serum? And so when I'm looking at metabolites in the urine, I'm looking mainly for patterns and ratios, not absolute values, right? It is helpful to look at, and we know phase one and phase two metabolism, there's certain metabolites that confer a higher risk for breast cancer. But you also get those, what's called the serum equivalent, where they add up everything and they give you the serum equivalent. Like if you were checking serum, this is what it would be. But again, it's a completely different compartment of the of the body. How can it be equivalent? And so, I, I mean, Mark is really at a quest for, for truth and trying yeah. to value do a lot of research. And I really admire that. But then when we spar off on this, I'm like, but I just don't know that it's accurately effect, affecting of uh, reflecting peripheral conversion. That yeah. is what I want to know. Like, how do I know that you're not flooding your estrone pathway in your breast and getting a lot of estrone, or maybe you're, you're not excre. So it's, I don't know. That's a, that's something that we need to look at. Like I have done urine and sal- saliva. Actually, he and I did a study on a patient of ours where we did urine, saliva, and serum every single day on the same patient. And then the last day we did it every hour to look at how it correlated. Wow. And, and- the results <laughs> weren't, you know, they weren't, she had, she had, she had had a hysterectomy, no ovaries. And so we were controlling what she was getting. She, you know, the first half of the cycle, she was getting estradiol patch and oral progesterone commercially available. Then we switched her to like, I think a Divi gel and a topical progesterone. Cause I wanted to see the difference between topical and versus oral in a patch. But what was just so interesting is like even just something, and that's what a lot of people miss is the pharmacokinetics of what you're giving with the gel, you're going to get spikes with the cream. You're not with the patch. You're not. So you, it's very nuanced in interpreting all the, this hormone monitoring, which is like, if you've poured your life into it, like I have in the science of it, but most practitioners, they just want to know, 
what do I do with the patient? Like, they don't want to <laughs> just know. tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, can I just write the prescription and go on? Like, they don't want to know like the science of like, okay, if you give Divi gel, it's got a 10 hour half-life. So when you see it here, it's going to do this. Or if you give a patch, it's got this, this, and you give an oral. I mean, that's how I trained with the pharmacist. So that's how I know. I think about the pharmacokinetics all the time because of that, but that's not what people do. And, and I don't think that even Mark really was, you know, so aware of like, even just these two things, the pharmacokinetics is different. So you're not going to see the same thing in the urine. You're not going to see the same thing in the blood and the saliva. And so that, that makes a huge difference to how you're looking at testing, like what you're testing. Yeah. So there's just so much that we don't know, but, but, the, but I do, I'm a huge fan of the dried urine test because I think it gives us so much information about estrogen metabolism. I see a patterns in my breast cancer patients that they do have either a problem with phase one, mostly I think phase two, but sometimes it's phase one, phase two seems to be the most significant to me. And then, you know, we have phase three, which is the gut. And then we now know with stool testing, we can get a beta glucuronidase level. I mean, your liver may be good for phase one, phase two, wrap up estrogen tiabo and slide it down to the gut to be excreted. But then if you're not pooping or you have issue, that beta glucuronidase enzyme, which is upregulated by abnormal bacteria or too much bacteria, it actually can send estrogen back in the system. And that's another thing that like a traditional OBGYN totally rolled her eyes and got, you know, oh, my bad. Oh, my the goodness. Fact that, and then I went to PubMed. Okay. Beta glucuronidase, estrone levels. There's tons of articles supporting that. You know, you just don't know what to look for. You know, like if you, yeah. don't, eat it, you don't know, right? So there is a lot of data. I was, I was amazed at how much for estradiol, systemic levels, breast cancer, beta glucuronidase. So there's data looking at that, all of that, and the science behind it. But again, like I said, initially, like we have to rely on what, who's either doing some bench basic science research or a drug company who's trying to get a product to market to get our data. You know, if it isn't a bit, if it, who's going to fund it just to see what estrogen metabolites are. You know? I wonder too, if that's why some women will gain weight. Like if they look like they're on their Dutch test, that they are metabolizing their estrogens through phase one and phase two really well. But yet they have no, you know, they have low levels of the estrone, estradiol and estriol. You, they're on hormone replacement therapy and suddenly they're gaining weight. I wonder if that is a sign that they are, they have a lot of estrone in the tissues because estrone is well, fat so producing. That's one of the reasons I don't just do urine. I do salivary testing and serum testing as well. And I have seen that, that salivary levels are elevated and then before I knew about stool testing, I'd be like, what am I missing? What am I missing? And then I finally do the gut. I'm like, oh, no wonder because of that, because I am seeing, you know, so other, other types of testing could be more representative tissue, like blood mm -hmm. spot testing, which is capillary blood right. or salivary testing. Now, again, yes, there's some data on salivary testing. Now, have they done a lot of research lately about it? Like what's, you know, for, to what end? Like who's going to fund it and what are they going to gain from that? Right. So yeah. that's, that's a, that's a problem. Yeah. So yeah. I guess, you know, yeah. how we get to the answer to all this huge, all these issues. I like to always do serum and Dutch at the same time, because that gives me a, a very good picture of at least what's happening in both those worlds, in right? A, in, a, in a premenopausal patient, but in a woman without ovaries, it's not going to, the serum is not going to really help you. No, right? it doesn't show anything. Yeah. yeah it's so, so there, you know, that, so yes, I mean, it is nice to have some of the levels at the same time. I mean, you know, that's why I do do still do salivary testing. Cause I feel like that is going to catch that aromatization a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, but once yeah. you start replacement saliva overshows, the hormone levels, correct? I haven't had that experience actually. That's, and that's oh, what I, have. that's what I'm I haven't, I've been doing it for 20 years and I haven't ha I had that experience that it overshows the level that overshows for progesterone top. Pro I was going to say progesterone. Yeah. For progesterone specifically, any way you measure it, whether it's serum, saliva, urine, if you give it, if you're giving it orally, it's going to be high in the urine, right? Because mm -hmm, my metabolites. Low in, in, you know, it, I mean, blood spot testing, urine, I, I've seen serum testing that's been crazy high, like crazy high from oral 100 milligrams micronized because it's, you know, that's not, again, slow release, it's immediate release. And depending on what time of day you're doing your serum testing, 
So I have not done that. And I, most of my patients are doing estradiol patches. And if anything, I'm seeing still low levels of the saliva. I'm not seeing elevated levels of estradiol. I'm not seeing, I mean, I am seeing some estrone elevated when I think it's cl clinically matching, but I don't see an over-representation of estrogen in the saliva with my population. I think that's what has Mark stumped. And even David Zava pulled all my, pa like years of my patients and saw, well, okay, I can see that the because they do that symptom assessment, it correlates that clinically their symptoms are getting better. Your levels are all low in saliva. They're not, you're not high in the treatment range, you know, the over treatment range, you're in the endogenous range and the, my patients are getting better, better clinically. You know, we're not following a bone density on every patient, but we're following them clinically that they have a resolution of symptoms. So, I mean, that, that, you know, with topical hormones, with a, a topical bias or a, even a divi gel, yes, you might see that overrepresentation. Certainly, with progesterone, topically, you're going to see an overrepresentation because it's so lipophilic. You know, but then so underrepresentation in serum. It's not very confusing. <laughs> well, because it doesn't. So when you put progesterone topically on, it's not going into the venous system yeah. to be measured in the system. It's going through the skin into the capillaries on the red blood cells are about three seconds. And a lot of the data by John Lee is saying that it's disseminated back out through the lymphatics. It doesn't get back into the venous system unless the tissue is so oversaturated by two overdosing that it's getting into the serum. And actually Dew and Stanzik and Zava did publish a test. I think it was in 2019 in the American Journal of OBGYN looking at just that 80 milligrams of topical progesterone. And they did blood spots, serum, saliva, and urine, I think, showing that it's underrepresented in the serum. That's why you can't measure topical hormone dosing, any, any hormone. And I know we're doing that for traditionally um, androgel and male testosterone levels because the gel will cause that spike in the serum. Yes. There has to be way overdosed to see that. And that's the problem. But yeah, I mean, so they're looking at other markers like hemoconcentration and calcium and that kind of and LFTs and that kind of thing. But a lot of a lot of the dosing of topical testosterone is way too high as well. Yeah. And then I find that it'll show really high in total testosterone, but then their free testosterone will be in range. And then oh, progesterone, yeah. the topical yeah. won't show in the blood. And then doctors think that, oh, you're not getting it. It's yes. not protecting your uterus, it's not protecting your breasts when it is. There has been research to show that topical progesterone works. Well, I don't think there's any research showing that it protects your breasts. Actually, there's one cell study that, that um, uh, who did that? Chang did it where he put topical uh, progesterone on the breast and it showed that. And there's a small study by Helene Leonetti that she did yes. look at uterus and endometrial biopsies, but it was small numbers. I don't think there's yeah. any research that shows that topical progesterone protects the uterus or the breast. That's part of the problem. We don't have that data. Does, is there any research that suggests a problem? No, but there's nothing showing that it protects it because again, who's done the research? The makers of oral. So what progesterone are they using in the studies that show that progesterone is breast protective? Oral. Oral. Yeah. Actually available oral. And then have you seen the research that shows very small amount of research? I'm going to forget his name. He's from Canada. I feel like it's Murphy something that shows that high. And actually, I think ZRT shows this, talks about this too, high amounts of um, the alpha metabolite from progesterone can increase your risk of breast cancer if yeah. it gets too high. There is some data with that. And I don't know about, I don't know about that because there's that conclusion of like, well, there is a progesterone receptor. So what does that mean? Now I always, so David Zava, before he even founded ZRT, he was a researcher for breast cancer. And so he, uh, I don't know. I mean, at one I time I, I knew that. heard him speak years ago where he talked about somehow he was also involved in like pathology of breast cancer. And, um, he always said like, if they were estrogen receptor positive, progesterone negative, or there was a discrepancy, it was because, you know, we know estrogen upregulates its own receptor and progesterone down regulates the estrogen receptor. Like those patients need progesterone. So if they have estrogen and progesterone positive, what does that mean? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so that I don't, we just don't have enough data on that. So, you know, for, for my breast cancer patients, I do have some that take progesterone that are premenopausal, 
But again, you have to, I have to tell the patients, I don't have a study to back this up. I don't know. You know, we, you know, try to get you a certain number of years from your diagnosis and treatment before we int introduce hormone therapy, but there's a lot we don't know. And then it becomes a quality of life issue when patients think, well, I'm five years out, I'm whatever, I need to do this. So there is a lot we don't know. And there isn't anybody looking into these questions. No, I know. And it's frustrating because there's also research that shows high amounts of progesterone. There was no increased risk of breast cancer. So I'm always, I get frustrated because it's like, well, does it or doesn't it then, you know, and, but then can you look at the metabolites? And if somebody is leaning towards that alpha pregnenediol pathway heavily, and they're on oral progesterone, do we see that as a warning sign? Like, Hey, you really push heavily down this pathway. Maybe we need to back it up on the oral and put some topical in. I mean, I, I, your, but your urine metabolites are going to be different if you're giving progesterone topical versus oral. Oral is always going to be high because you're giving it oral and 90% of it is going in the urine. So is that increase in metabolites reflective of the type of route of administration or the actual, right. so we don't really know. Yeah. So that's yeah. the issue with that. So it's very I know there's, there's, a lot, <laughs> there's a lot that we don't know and have to work through. And like I said, what I try to do is straddle the evidence and, and yeah take what we do know about the science and treat the patient properly, you know, hormonally, and then give some options and some insight into these patients with breast cancer as to what was the problem? Was there a problem with your metabolism? Was there a problem with your detoxification? Was there a problem with your endogenous levels that led you to be at this risk? You mm -hmm. know, because like I said, in the, in, in the, my patients that are young, they're given no alternative except for chemical castration. And then, that there's a whole nother issue set of issues with that too. Mm -hmm. Consequences like heart disease and bone loss. I mean, the death rate two years after a hip fracture is higher than 10 years 50. after breast cancer. Yeah. Yeah. It was terrible. I was shocking to hear that actually. So what do, let's talk about then the metabolites, because what do they, what can they tell us when we're doing a Dutch test and we're seeing this phase one, phase two metabolization of the estrogen, can you explain those pathways and what they represent? So it's my belief that part of the issue with estrogen-related pathology, whether it's breast cancer, endometriosis, uh, fibroids, lies in the failure of estrogen metabolism. So phase one and phase two happen in the liver. Phase one is cytochrome P450. There's three options. There's three enzymes. Those are genetically coded, and we know we have SNPs that can upregulate those enzymes, meaning upregulation, meaning it will be a more of a preference to go down that pathway. Out of those three pathways, one of them ends up in 4-hydroxyestrone, which is thought to be um, more toxic because if it doesn't get methylated, it's going to become a quinone, which is going to cause DNA adducts, and it's going to turn on DNA and cause more harm, oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, and harm to DNA, turn on that, you know, that rapid multiplying. So that phase one, we look out for the amount of the 4-hydroxy, which on the dried urine test will be red. Phase two is methylation, where you have this intermediate metabolite, and, and then it's methylated, which means you put a methyl group on it. So it's inactivated. It's not as carcinogenic, and then it can be gone. It, it will go into the... Um, the gut to be pooped out, you know, or it might be in the urine to be excreted. And so that's where we get into the phase three, which is thought to be the gut and beta glucuronidase and everything. So most of my patients with breast cancer have some flaw. I mean, I think there's been really like one that I've ever seen that had a great estrogen metabolism. Wow. The patients have flaws and especially if I can get them premenopausally in, in endogenous hormones, um, have flaws in their estrogen detoxification. More commonly, it seems to be the COMPT SNP, which is phase two or methylation. Um, it's as if you're charging on your credit card and you're not paying it off. And so you have that balance, which is creating an interest. And so even if you cut up that credit card and you never used it again, you would st still be paying on that balance for years. So it's this excess of estrogen that is not getting inactivated is available to agonize the receptor and cause growth. Estrogen causes growth. Estrogen upregulates its own receptor to cause more growth. And we know progesterone causes apoptosis or programmed cell death. And so you get that estrogen dominance because you're not getting rid of estrogen and it's available. And so 
you know, again, there's that, there's that, okay, if it's not coming out in the urine, does that mean it's in the tissues where, you know, how do we quantify tissues versus serum isn't a reflection of tissues, you know? So, um, that's my belief. And I have seen that correlation with a lot of breast cancer patients. And the cool thing about, um, the genetics is we have epigenetics, which we know we can manipulate some of those enzymes. So it's easier to up, uh, upregulate the two hydroxy pathway, which is cytochrome 1A1, and that can be upregulated by broccoli, kale, cabbage, dim, blueberries, because I've seen patients that it shifts and they have a higher percentage of that after we have those interventions. Phase two, we would think about magnesium. We think about B vitamins, possibly SAMe. SAMe can have some side effects, so it's not for everyone. Um, so we can augment methylation as well. Um, with that phase. And certainly with the beta glucuronidase, we can see um, that level go down and the patient symptomatically get better as well. Oh, yes. Okay. So is the, is somebody's profile, let's say they're showing that they're, they're, they're pushing down that four hydroxylation pathway that maybe they're not doing very well, or that they're a slow comp, have slow comp. Does it always match up to their DNA? Do you find? Like where then you will go and you'll be like, oh, see, they do have two SNPs on that Compton. So yeah, they are a slow, you know, metabolizer of estrogen. Or can you have these problems without having the SNPs? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, I have a 1B1 upregulation, which is not good when it's paired with the heterozygous comp. That's what I have. And I have three out of four COMT or not COMT, MTHFR. Yeah. Well, um, so, uh, but my estrogen my, my detox looked okay. I, and I had a patient, um, sometime this week or last week that was a, a homozygote comp at two, two different SNPs. It was like V158M and also H, I think H62H homozygote. And her reflection on the Dutch test was good methylation. Now, again, one of the criticisms of this dried urine test is that they're not looking at the four hydroxy. They're just looking at the two hydroxy. And if you look at like Genova's urine, they do look at the 4-hydroxy. And I haven't looked, I know Dr. Data has a new one. Um, I haven't done theirs yet. I think I have it like in the queue. I have like the test there and I haven't done it yet. Um, so that's one of the criticisms by some of my colleagues is like, you're just looking at 2-hydroxy now. Some people would say the 4-hydroxy is such lower quantity. It's hard to measure in urine. That's what we don't repeat it. That's what Mark would say. Uh, so, you know, but other labs do repeat, do, do report it. And so are we missing that? I don't know. That methylation index, I think is confusing on that test. I mean, cause sometimes, you know, people, sometimes it'll be over or sorry, they yeah, love. It looks normal, but then it's not 50% of the two hydroxylation. Well, in answer to your question, it doesn't always match up because yeah. And if you have someone that's doing these lifestyle changes and, you know, their epigenetics are kicking in, mm -hmm. somebody who's not, you know, the SNP may, might match better. Yeah. And even if they don't have a problem, let's say with methylation, but yet they are not eating a nutrient dense diet or they have really low levels of vitamin Bs, would that then affect their methylation, even if they don't have those SNPs? Yeah. I've seen that as well, that the okay. methylation doesn't look good as far as the urine metabolites, but they don't have SNPs. Okay. And so what can somebody do if they see that they have, they're pushing down the more toxic pathways or they're not methylating? You've talked about the methylation piece and magnesium, B vitamins are, are great for that. What about phase one? What are your favorite things to be using in phase one and for the quinone um, if you're going yeah, through so there? The for the quinone pathway, the uh, peroxidase P450 is definitely resveratrol and sometimes NAC. And there's some data that that actually helps in endometriosis, NAC specifically. There was a study that was published in the last couple of months. Um, so that's a great option. Of course, on the dried urine test, you get the glutathione marker, which is also nice to see because it depends on, do they have GSTPX SNPs? Do they have glutathione SNPs? You know, so that's going to add to it. Um, so it's not just these phase one and phase two SNPs, it's also other things. Um, so NAC and resveratrol would be what I would like to use. Of course, DIM we use, um, which increases the 2-hydroxy pathway. We talked to them about dietary lifestyle. Again, cortisol, what's their cortisol doing? Cortisol can slow the whole thing down, you know? So it doesn't matter if they're loading up on all nutritious foods, if their weight, if their cortisol is through the roof, you know, and they're way stressed out, that's not any good either. 
Yeah. What does, what is cortisol? Have they measured cortisol in women with breast cancer? And if that's a factor, the only studies that I've seen, and again, there's not a lot is that when you have a flat cortisol curve, it correlates with a poor prognosis in breast cancer. Now the high cortisol, you know, cortisol is one of those things too, like Goldilocks too low is not good. Too high is not good. Right. So you can get more autoimmune diseases when you have abnormal cortisol and low immunity when you have abnormal cortisol. So high cortisol and stress seems to slow down estrogen detoxification. I don't know if you can say what, at what point is it, is it one of the phases? Is it phase one, phase two? What is it? Is it just the inflammation? You know, what is it? I don't know. I can't really answer that, but it seems to be that I, I witness that a lot. Wow. Yeah. I, I would think so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And there was a guy that A4M in December that was, did a whole talk about, he used to, he's a biologist, I think, or, and he used to own Genova, I think, or work for them. Anyways, he did a whole speech on cortisol's effect on the liver and how that's, this is like this missing piece and how it can back up and cause fatty liver disease. And I would think just that alone would then affect how you're processing your estrogens. Maybe, maybe cortisol affects cytochrome P450 then. I don't know. So yeah, I mean, yeah. maybe that's where it is, the phase one. So, but yeah. definitely there is a correlation and think these things don't exist in isolation. Yeah. So liver is detoxing 24 seven. It's not something that just happens a certain time, you know? Yeah. Okay. So to wrap this up, we're basically, <laughs> I feel like the answer basically is each person is an individual and it depends on your history and how you're detoxing your estrogens. And we know that estrone is very growth promoting. So if you've got breast cancer cells, this can make that grow, correct? Yeah. I mean, that would be the implication that I think estrone matters. Your percentage of estrone, your amount of estrone, that's something that we always follow. Yes. And that there is research showing that women that use progesterone, oral progesterone, can really be very breast protective. So even if you do not have a uterus, it's still very important to be taking progesterone with your estrogen if you're choosing to replace it. Please don't ever take estrogen only. I know. Please, no. I know. I know. I know but I just mean three studies. I was like the nurses health study, the E3 EPIC. And then there was another one, I think it was in the Lancet, but I, I don't have that one on the top of my head. So yes. Yeah. And it's a problem. I've had so countless women recently telling me that they've, and I've, that I've worked with and that have written in about to the podcast about that they have progesterone sensitivity. And that's always a very oh, tough mm-hmm. thing to face because the solution is typically then to use the morena or something that's going to protect the uterus. Um, I would love to to dig into that. And I'm not saying I haven't seen that. I have seen that. I don't know what that is. Is that an incipient in the progesterone itself? Is that, did they also have that to compound it? Was it the dose related? Did they have it with topical? Did they have it? You know, I have a few patients that we have tried different levels of it. Um, A lot of progesterone is related to dose and the balance between estrogen. But I, I have people who tell me that they have an uh, intolerance to their own progesterone endogenous yeah. PMDD sure happen. Yeah. There is one researcher who has done research on it and it's a sensitivity to the, with the GABA receptors in the brain. And it's not that you have too much or too little. It's how your how those receptors are acting to, it's like a sensitivity um, Laura, Dr. Laura Bryden talks about it as well. These are the only two women that I've seen talking about it besides myself that are saying like this, this does happen. And so some people do get the sensitivity, but what I've seen is that some people don't have it from their own, but they get it from replacement cream and oral. That's so gotta be like- excipient though, right? If they don't have it from their own and there gets either gotta be dosage or an excipient in the actual formulation, right? It's I've had to- them though, like, okay, well, let's try a suppository. Let's try it this way. Let's try. And all, I've had not very many, I think maybe two who it didn't matter what form, what dose they were reacting to it and like weepy That's and depressed and tired and you people as well. And I don't yeah. know what that is from. Yeah. I know it's a strange thing. And I, I hope that there's going to be more information coming out about it, but um, it's always a tough one because then they can't take progesterone and 
maybe not estrogen then. So yeah. anyways, ladies, I hope this has shed some light on it. <laughs> that This is very complicated topic. Tara clearly is the expert on this. You've done your research and you're still continuing to do the research. And hopefully there is some money put into this because it's such an important topic that really needs some light to be shed on it because so many women are going, are missing out on the benefits of estrogen. There are so many benefits to replacing your estradiol in menopause. And that is fact. And you can research that and you'll see it, but there is, you know, there is a risk of breast cancer in there as well. So, well, we can't say there's no risk. That's true. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, ladies, thank you so much for tuning in to today's podcast. Thank you, Dr. Tara Scott for being here. It was very enlightening and I hope to have you back again. Thank you, Karen.